Hello and welcome to Future SciChat. Every week on Future Chat, we sit down to talk about science and technology with a discussion centered on a new and exciting topic in one of those two fields. My name is Robert Trell and I'm joined, as usual, by my cousin Mike. We've also got a special guest, Nick Maddox, with us. We're just a couple of science enthusiasts who love to learn and talk about the latest and greatest science and tech developments. I hope you're excited to join us today while we talk about climate change. We're fortunate to be joined today by Nick Maddox, as I mentioned, the first person to have his beard featured in the National Archives of Canada. Just a few of the topics we hope to cover this week are how the climate change debate isn't really all that controversial, how the changing climate will affect us, how the changing climate will affect us over the years, and the possibility that low-lying territory will be underwater anytime soon. Join us as we jump headlong into the future of science. There's a lot to talk about today, but we'll cover as much as we can. So, how are you guys doing? I'm doing great. Me too. I, <laughs> I'm... That's fantastic music, Rob. <laughs> I, uh, I really like it too. Uh -huh. um, I recently, I'll give you guys a bit of a, a background on what I did yesterday. I finished a little trailer for the channel. Uh, a trailer? Around and a half, and I don't know exactly when we're going to release it, but uh, in the next few weeks, I would imagine, at the very longest. Oh my god, uh, I'm I really have so much about input it. For, a potential, uh, for a potential trailer. We should talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just have like an overly dramatic, like Dark Knight style. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I'm going to go that direction, but we'll talk about something else. Fine, Rob. Don't get anyone excited <laughs> for this. That that can be the teaser, maybe. <laughs> All right, sure. Very Batman-esque trailer. <laughs> or like Inception music. <laughs> and it's just like us, like. Yeah. <laughs> so. As I mentioned earlier, we are going to be talking this week about climate change. And I wanted to I wanted to definitely cover this topic, but I also wanted to make sure that when we covered it, we had had a bit of a feel for how things work cuz this one, while it might not be controversial for us, is is controversial for reasons that we're going to get into um, even though it might that might not necessarily be for any good reason. Um, so I guess let's start by taking a little quick poll of you guys who are scientists and sort of don't necessarily have to take everything the media says at face value and can go in and do a bit more research and actually be informed yourselves <coughs> about climate. So Mike, why don't we start with you? What What is climate to you? Climate to me is long-term trends, uh, kind of an overall sense of how the environment behaves over a certain time period or just over time in general. Um, and I think, yeah, climate is obviously dynamic and, and it can change and does change. Um, and from our understanding of how it works so far, it goes through cycles and those cycles are influenced by various things, not in, limited to uh, solar and uh, just various other influences like asteroid impacts and stuff like that. Yeah, and we'll get into more specifics on what the actual impact or things that can impact it are. How about you, Nick? I think the best analogy I've ever heard for climate versus weather is, yeah, climate is long-term trends in the weather. So, I mean, I think the best example would be like Jonas Gustafsson from the Leafs preseason a few years back. <laughs> where, you know, he was just standing on his head and was amazing and, like, just shut the door at every opportunity. And that would be, like, great weather for Jonas Gustafsson. But if you looked at his overall, t or all of his time with the Leafs, it wasn't that great. So, you know, if you could have, like, Jonas Gustafsson from that one game in net every night, that'd be great, but that's more like the weather of Jonas Gustafsson, but the climate of Jonas Gustafsson wasn't nearly as nice. Interesting. I'm not sure that's a perfect metaphor, <laughs> but I like it in theory. Or like, if you were if you were choosing like Jonas Gustafsson from that game or an overall Martin Brodeur, 
Yeah. Go Mark, with Mark Timber 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 Timber. Bad, bad games, but overall he's going to make it into the Hall of Fame pretty much a lock for that at this point. Because he, he would be a great climate goaltender. Yes. Um, so the most, the most compelling, I guess, <clears throat> metaphor that I would use is the one I would have to steal one from Cosmos and so Neil deGrasse Tyson described it as the weather, it, it's, say you're walking the do- your dog um, the path that your dog takes when he's going around sniffing flowers and other dogs butts and anything that smells interesting uh, that that's the weather and the path that you, the dog owner walk is pretty much straight the dog has a leash, and so your path would be the path of the climate, and the dog would sort of zigzag around, um, but follow you. So, a, if weather changes overall over a long period of time, you get climate change. But on a day-to-day basis, having a cold winter doesn't necessarily mean that the climate is changing. And especially having a cold week doesn't mean the climate is changing. <laughs> Unlike in newscasts when they're like, oh boy, is it cold so much for global warming, eh? <laughs> or, or when it's blistering and they're like, oh man, that global warming. Whew. It's really, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even, even things as, as big and sort of overreaching as the El Nino and El Nino, or La Nina uh, weather patterns that happen over, I think it's, it's around uh, a yearly year-ish cycle, whether or not it happens or not. Uh, that's not really climate either. It's just how, I, from my understanding of El Nino, is when large amounts of either warm or cold water are moving around in the uh, ocean basins. The Pacific? Usually it's Pacific. Um, if, for instance, warm air rises, you're going to get a lot warmer on average summer. You're going to get a lot rainier summer. Um, and it's just, that's kind of small scale climate more than weather because it's not sort of a day to day or week to week thing, but it's still not really climate in the way that, in the way that we're talking about climate change now as, as a science community, that's not really climate change either because those are cycles that are always happening and the variations among those are going to be what climate becomes. And so I guess the first, the, or not, the before we get too far into specifics, we should talk about the fact that there is a scientific consensus that climate is in fact changing right now and it's getting warmer. And should we qualify that by saying there's a consensus that it's human influenced? Yeah. I I think it's always been understood that there is climate change. Like right. and based the, on the cycles. Climate obviously does change from time to yeah. time. But yeah, but this is the, based on human-influenced climate change. Anthropogenic, yeah. if you will. Right, that's the word I was looking for, yeah. Uh, and it's, <laughs> it's interesting that w- one of the things, um, when I was researching for this, one of the things that I found was the fact that, and, and you, you kind of get a sense for this every time a, a so-called controversy comes up in the media, is that, you can get somebody, typically the person that the science community recruits, so to speak, is Bill Nye to talk about climate change. And then they'll get someone else, possibly a scientist, possibly just a a lobbyist or a a personality, uh, representing the fact that climate change isn't caused by humans and there's nothing we can do about it and we're just sort of along for the ride. Uh, But news sources and the media treats this as though there are two sides to the story. Whereas there's one person representing fact and one person representing a different opinion that's that's not at all objective. And in fairness, like that's how the media is supposed to operate. You're supposed to treat things as, or the, you're supposed to treat an issue as a story with two sides to it. Yeah, but conventionally, like that's, <laughs> yeah, conventionally yes. But that's why it's lasted as long as it has. Whereas like. You know, that one side isn't actually 50% of the story. It's mm-hmm. like a weird fringe group that's just kind of angry and upset, I think. Um, but I think that's also, like, why the BBC has recently said... I think it was the BBC. They said, like, so 
on matters of science like this, we're not presenting equal sides to the story because there isn't, like, right. it's not a two-sided story. And that's why the BBC is the BBC. <laughs> At least they're the, as far as I know, they're the first ones to really do that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, the other, any other news organization, especially North America, is going to, is almost going to downplay the scientific consensus as, as being, I don't, I don't really know what, uh, because I've, I've never really thought that, but they tend to look at the scientists saying climate change is caused by us. We know the earth is big, but humans have a big impact on earth. Uh, and they tend to go, oh, look at those nerdy scientists with their lab coats, and and they don't know what they're talking about. They're just guessing, and because they hear the word forecast and they hear the word projection, and think, oh, that's complete. It's completely made up, and we don't necessarily have to put stock in it until it starts happening. Yeah, I think I think what the issue is that, in a sense, the scientists are the minority numbers wise, but out of those who actually have enough background knowledge and authority to have a you know logical opinion on something they're the majority so it's kind of like of the scientific community they have that understanding that there's human driven climate change whereas in the grand scheme of the population of the world they're probably in the minority still because there aren't 3 billion scientists right if that makes sense yeah. so I think in that sense like you know they're saying oh yeah it's like the nerdy scientists like oh they're just that small group kind of thing Right, and that's that's kind of the way it's always been. Mm -hmm. There was the whole issue. I mean, in the in the Middle Ages, people were trying would try to suggest alternate models of anything. Like the the main example I can think of is Galileo, literally being locked up by the Catholic Church for suggesting. Oh, I'm sorry. Are we talking about the heretic now? <laughs> well, he wasn't he actually recently in the last ten years or so, maybe fifteen years, pardoned by the Catholic Church. Yeah, and I gotta say, the Catholics are getting soft. Like, <laughs> you can't allow this kind of thing to happen. Who is he to suggest that the sun is the center of our of our uh, of our planet? Well, clearly, it's us guys. I mean, we're sitting on the Earth, and the stars go around us. So, <laughs> what more do you need to Obviously, know? Obviously, just saying. <laughs> yeah, and the fact that. The that tide goes in, the tide comes out. You can't explain that, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's things like that, um, which is actually a direct quote from Bill O'Reilly, that make me think that he is playing a character knowingly just as much as Stephen Colbert is, because that is just a completely ridiculous thing to say. I don't know, maybe he just... Sorry, are you saying he's saying... trolling everyone? <laughs> Not he's trolling, but I think he's being... He has a job. He's being... He's, <laughs> give this narrative, yeah. and I don't think he necessarily believes tide goes in, tide comes out, we don't even know what's happening. That's what <laughs> fairness, in that debate, he was debating like an actual scientist or something like that, or no, he was debating like, for lack of a better description, an evangelical atheist, Right. and like, the guy was like, well, yeah, but I mean, just because we don't know why the tide goes in or comes out, like, that doesn't mean there's a supernatural force behind it. And, like, everyone watching is like, oh, <laughs> He's supposed to be the other what side. What is happening? <laughs> I, yeah, I really, I really love when things like that happen. I mean, they're, they're terrible objectively from a scientific standpoint. But it's hilarious, and you kind of just have to tune out at that point and say, all right, well, when you have a rational debate, we'll come back and pay attention. Well, I think, if I can go back to our previous point, I think, like, part of the problem with, like, widestream acceptance of climate change is, at least in part due to media portrayal, because, like, from talking to people that aren't necessarily sold on climate change or global warming, anthropogenic global warming, a lot of them will say, well, you know, the Earth does a bunch of weird, complicated things and we can't know for sure. Or another big one is, 
Well, I mean, what does science know? Because, I mean, I read in the paper one day that, like, eggs are good for me, and then I read in the paper the next day that eggs are bad for me, and I don't even know what to think anymore, or stuff like that. So, I don't know. Also, you'll hear them reference, like, well, in the 1970s, they thought we were headed for global cooling, so what's going on here, guys? And, yeah, I think it's... I think it's a lot of like media outlets trying to really grasp onto a headline and not fully explaining the issue. And I mean, get that gets views and that gets clicks and that gets eyes on you, but it doesn't really fully explain the story. Right. Uh, there's also a certain amount of credence you have to give to the fact that there's a lot of money behind not climate change. Uh, well, government policy that would... Well, government policy that's been guided and shaped by lobbying money from companies who are producing a lot of pollution and don't want to suffer any consequences from it. Uh, and it's actually, it's kind of nice that the climate, the climate is actually starting to change. We're starting to see overall... Yeah, that's great. No, I mean, <laughs> in, terms of, in terms of trying to show people... In an like, I told you so sense. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> like, this thing we predicted is happening now, and it's, it's in some cases, it's worse than we are seeing, than we thought it would be. Um, the, one of the interesting things, uh, and so I, I'll bring up your point here, Mike. Are there any arguments against anthropogenic, human-driven global warming? It, was there a specific point or an argument that you wanted to bring up against it that we could sort of talk about and maybe straw man? <laughs> I think, <laughs> maybe. I, think, I mean, I, think, I don't know. <laughs> I think the main, probably one of the main things is that there's a question of, oh, well, who's to say this wouldn't have happened anyway? You know, based on solar solar activity or just general trends looking back at ice ages and hot periods and whatever, right? Um, and then there's the idea of... Uh, you know, it's like, oh, you know, over the last 10 years has been our coolest years or whatever, right? Like, so they'll look at a short term and just say, oh, well, what do you mean it's not war it's warming? It's been cooling the last however long, right? So, you know, you have the short time frame um, syndrome, and then you have the, well, who's to say that this wouldn't have happened anyway syndrome as far as how much of our effect is is causing. I think those would be the two main things. Okay. Okay. Uh We'll talk about those. The one other one that I wanted to mention is the one that I have recently sort of clarified my own position internally about climate change. But for a while there, I, I was sort of on the same thing. I was like, well, in the when I heard that in the 70s they were talking about possible global cooling, I was like, well, do they do they know? Or are they, like, these models they're working with, how good are they? But the more that I've looked into it for myself, the more I've seen, like, yeah, this is this is actually a consensus and there's there's a lot of stuff that everybody believes and does and acts on based on science that are much less known and much less based in fact. This is happening, it's just a matter of how bad it's going to be if we don't do anything or if we do or, or if we start changing things. Um, and I, I think that it's easy to fall into that trap. Humans are, are very I don't want to say paternal because that's not that's a different word, but they're very pattern driven. When we see something happening, we see it, we wake up and we see something, and then mm -hmm. the next day it happens again. That to us is what is happening. We don't mm -hmm. really have a grasp on longer range forecasting, unless you have been trained by generally a science background to look at things overall. And so one of the uh, arguments that I had thought about global warming was sort of, we are tiny, we like the human mass could fit on like 0.1% of Earth, like if we all were in one place this was an XKCD if every human was all in one big pack clumped together we would be just this tiny tiny little blob on Earth like how can we possibly be affecting the climate there's trillions of uh, gallons of atmosphere 
how can we possibly impact it just us? And what I've been learning, what I what I uh, have found out is that most of the atmosphere, like the nitrogen and the oxygen, has very little impact on climate. It's there, and it, I mean, the oxygen helps us live, <laughs> breathe, and the nitrogen is there, so, I mean, it's not there, so stuff doesn't catch fire, but it's <laughs> catch fire from high oxygen content. But the main things that are driving climate change right now and the greenhouse effect are much less than 1% of the atmosphere. Things like carbon dioxide, things like sulfates and nitrates and water vapor are tiny, tiny percentages of the atmosphere. Like we're, we're measuring carbon dioxide right now in parts per million, it's 400. Um, so you, I started to come around and see we actually can have an impact because we, we, like you hear, I, I can't quote numbers because they're they're always different, but in terms of carbon dioxide, you hear all the time about how many billions of liters of carbon dioxide we're putting into the atmosphere on a daily, weekly, or yearly basis, and it's just going up and up since we went through the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy to see over time how we can be changing this climate. Mm -hmm. um, is there something that you think we, like a, a way that you can explain, because right now for me, I don't want to get into global warming conversations because, or at least I didn't. I, I was going to say, is that why we have a future chat on climate change <laughs> no, right now, Rob? Or? I, I wasn't informed enough to, to want to talk about it. I know that if you start going into a conversation, you maybe don't know a lot about it because it's controversial. You don't want to state your position and then be wrong. Uh, do you think that there's some some kind of argument that we could make as informed sci rep representatives of the scientific community when we're talking with friends or acquaintances or people we meet about climate change? Is there something, some way that we can convey that information in a simple way that might not necessarily change minds because it's really really hard to change people's minds when they once they think something, but just sort of help them to see that maybe we are like obviously yeah. we are having an impact, but how to? If I may, that. yeah. Um, like the, uh, I think it was like one of the last episodes of Cosmos. They talked about it. And to me, that was probably, like, the most convincing argument on the matter. Like, the fact that, uh, I forget whether it's lighter or heavier, but the carbon dioxide naturally occurring in, like, ambient conditions is, you know, it's mostly, there's mostly carbon-12, but there is some carbon-14, which is created when you have bombardment from cosmic rays or whatever. So, while while uh, carbon dioxide is actually like out and doing things, it actually gets just a little tiny bit heavier from being exposed to things. Mm -hmm. But once, once something dies or stops freely exchanging carbon with the ambient carbon dioxide, it will start uh, decaying and going back towards carbon-12. So the carbon dioxide that you get from fossil fuels or something like that is just slightly, slightly lighter than the carbon dioxide which naturally occurs out there. So, like, when you're looking at ice cores to try and figure out how much carbon dioxide has been in the atmosphere historically, you find that after the Industrial Revolution occurred, you started getting lighter and lighter samples of carbon dioxide out of it with the same number of molecules. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, you can tell the number of molecules with a mass spectrometer. You can also get the weight, relatively speaking, with a mass spectrometer. And so, I mean, to me, that's the most convincing argument there is that we are having an effect that when you actually take historical samples of carbon dioxide, they get lighter and lighter the more carbon we've dumped into the atmosphere. And... I mean, there you have it. That's our effect on the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is not the most active molecule, but 
because of its pre prevalence, it plays the biggest role in global warming, and we're having an effect. Like, I, yeah. yeah. I think the main issue, though, like, is the global warming we're seeing now is coinciding with a lot of other things that could also potentially explain the <clears throat> climate. You know, people will say, like, oh, you know, we're due for a warming. We've been in a cooling. We're, we were in a low, and now we're on our way back up. Or, you know, solar activity has been that much higher since we've been, you know, recording the activity of the sun, that kind of thing, right? Um, so I think when you start giving numbers like that, then there's always an answer for it. And I think, you know, it's kind of the same thing in, you know, the evolution debate. Um, that is, like, you know, there's there's so much evidence and this scientific consensus on, yeah, that's what's happening or that's what's that's the active mechanism that you almost have to defer to the experts in it, the climate scientists, because even just, you know, I'm not a climate scientist. Like, none of us are climate scientists, so we don't have that background or authority to even be speaking on the subject from a, uh, you know, an objective point of view kind of thing. We're listening to what we hear for evidence and... Um, so you almost have to say, well, you know, that's just the scientific consensus right now, and that's to the best of our knowledge, that's what's happening. Like, I like, it's it's not like, oh, well, that's just what people believe, but it's like, well, the experts are all saying that, so I think we'd be fairly um, arrogant to say that we have a different understanding and we're the ones that are right. No, I'm pretty. I'm usually right. <laughs> I think I'm safe in saying that. <laughs> Like, it's, it's not to say that the evidence isn't convincing or anything, but if you're trying to educate the general public, that's almost what you have to do is say, well, that's just how it works. Like, it, yeah. Like, I don't know. What do you think, Rob? I mean, that that's a kind of a slippery argument because it just is, is... But it's, it's not an it's just is, but it's like you could go through all the evidence and stuff, but, but people tend to not have the capacity to, of, like... Well, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, that makes sense, right? Like, even carbon-12, carbon-14, like, the general public isn't going to understand the difference of what that even means. Right. Um, yeah. I feel it's the responsibility of scientists, <laughs> like us. <laughs> well, that's why we're having this. <laughs> yeah. It, um, yeah. Although, the, I mean, there could be other factors at play. And, I mean, yeah. that's not to say there isn't, but we are playing a role. Yeah. And, yeah, I suppose that's one of the bigger... Well, I think that's the bigger source of debate within the scientific community is how much of it yeah. is anthropogenic, not that it's changing, but how much is us. Yeah. yeah. Which is also something, I think, that's lost on the masses. Yeah. Um. One of the things that I learned, again, in researching for this, is just exactly what the sort of low-risk possibility is, what the medium-risk possibility is, and what the high-risk possibility is, and what percent, what, how likely those outcomes are to happen. And it was interesting to me that it's, they said it was about 5% chance, based on all, all the different models and all the different uh, research that's been done, about 5% is the so-called runaway uh, carbon dioxide um, levels <laughs> and therefore greenhouse effect. Um, and basically saying that if it goes that, that way and, and it can, we can only make it worse by continuing to put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere like we have been or at a, at a higher rate, um, we could end up with something like between a 5 and 10 degree increase in Global, or average global surface temperature, and that would be within rec certainly within recorded history, maybe within scientific history, fairly unprecedented. Without some kind of, for example, asteroid impact, most of the temperature changes that we've been talking, that we've been seeing in the data in ice cores, for instance, or in uh, they've also looked at carbon that's been stored in coral, for instance, or on the seafloor. Um, most of the changes that we've been seeing are on the order of less than half a degree per 100 years. And we're talking about several degrees in average global temperature increase. 
one of the scariest things about that worst case scenario is that we have no way of knowing what's going to happen if if that course comes to bear. We don't know what impact it'll have on crops. We don't know what impact it'll have on populations having to move, on water and where lakes will either dry up or where, where new ones will form. Obviously, the water's not going to go anywhere, but more of it's going to be in the atmosphere. Uh, a lot more heat is going to be trapped by the oceans. The oceans are going to warm up. It's going to melt ice. I mean, there's all kinds of bad things that can happen. Whereas on the low risk end, we'll see maybe half a degree or a degree increase in average surface temperature. Humans are going to, we can adapt to that really easily. We're very good at adapting to temperature within the, re, the range that you find here on Earth. But the effects of that kind of low risk thing are going to be a lot more subtle than if the worst case scenario happens and we get this massive summer start to become 40, 45 degrees and winters, it barely snows or whatever, so whatever the case may be. Um, we can't really know what the outcome of that will be. And oh, what? There was a super interesting study that came out like recently, and they were talking about, like they were looking at uh, plant distribution because it's been generally accepted that like as northern or you know polar climes become more temperate, like you know, so here for example, you'd think that like the more southern plants would start coming up north as the temperatures allow for it. What they're finding is it's not that at all. Like, the more northern plants are starting to come downward because of, like, like water stresses and things like that. So it's the more northern plants that are like, oh, hey, suddenly I'm competitive with these ones that just don't handle drought well. But, yeah, so, like, mm. just an example of... Un like, nobody predicted that happening, but apparently that's what's ending up happening. Huh. It, it, it's hard to see things from that kind of perspective. The side of... We, like, if you, don't, if you don't really think about something, if you never really think about what would happen if these hardier plants that were up north were so suddenly had the ability to move south and start competing with less hardy plants but when you think about it it's like yeah well there's thousands of things like that that we haven't even thought about mm -hmm. anything not anything but a lot of things could happen mm -hmm. well I mean it's also like based on human experience up to this point in history it's just you know kind of throwing a few dice around and seeing what will happen like because, I mean, our models and everything we know is built upon the climate as we know it. So all of a sudden you, you know, throw a wrench into the works and how can you possibly know what's going to happen? Hmm. Unless you use, like, CCSD simulations, and those are really expensive to run. Well, and, and you can be sure that they are being run regardless. If they have computer models that are modeling the the entire universe, and they, like the human brain. You can bet that they have <laughs> much cheaper computers running simulations of climate models. Uh, one of the other things that I thought we should definitely talk about is things we can do as, indiv as people, as individual countries, and as a global civilization to fight back against climate change. Not that we we obviously humans survive very well at the range of temperatures of, I don't know 0 to 30, I would say, maybe even between 10 and 30 degrees Celsius. That's sort of our butter zone for survival so far because that's that's most of what we've been faced with. So when I talk about fighting climate change, it's not it's not like this thing that, have, that is that is out to get us and trying to heat the earth. Um, we want basically to keep things the way they are. We don't. We wouldn't want things to get a lot cooler. We wouldn't want things to get a lot warmer. Um, and there's a there's sort of a, a bit of an academic exercise that wonders if we even should be concerned with trying to counteract the climate change that we've been noticing happening. Uh, so maybe 
we could get into a little bit of some of the things we have done, some of the things we can still do or can do better, and whether we actually should be trying to either pass legislation or um, enact protocols like the Kyoto Protocol to counteract this change. I mean, on the end, what, I, what my mind keeps going back to is Earth and the biosphere and every, every 99% of uh, species are going to be fine to climate change because they just sort of live their lives, they adapt when things change. It's our civilization that that is probably going to be the worst off if the climate changes. Are you saying that life will uh, 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 find a way? Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know, what do you think, Mike? You're, you had a note in here about wanting to talk about whether it's futile, whether you should be focusing on trying to do this at all. I think I'm... I'm probably fairly cynical in uh, <laughs> about a lot of things, and one of those is just, you know, about human nature and, and how people interact with each other, especially when it comes to compromising their own self-interest. And, you know, like affecting climate change with, uh, you know, our own personal efforts, that takes a united effort and a collective effort, and honestly, I don't see that happening enough on a large enough scale to actually make a difference as far as stopping it yeah you know you can enact laws or whatever but you know like you just said before the show that Canada backed out of the Kyoto Protocol like three years ago like when when you sign on to something and you can just back out of it like yeah that's not that's not a good sign that we're heading in the right direction that that you know people are gonna stick to their to their commitments and and make that effort so I'd like in in a sense I guess I'd say that it is a futile I think it's worth being aware of but I think for our own benefit is probably we're probably better off preparing for the anticipated change in climate due to what we're doing as opposed to trying to stop it. If you're looking at a pure economic and effort efficiency sense. Right. It's I mean, not ideal, but it's yeah. you know from a purely cynical standpoint, I can <laughs> agree with you. <laughs> but if you want to have an actual discussion, I think it's a lot more gray than that. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, in fairness, though, like, we've spent roughly the last 200 years using carbon as an energy currency. And, I mean, like, the first actual big things that we did, like freight trains and steamships and stuff like that, like, that was coal. Mm -hmm. And... Granted, we figured out that that was causing all kinds of problems, and we were like, oh, hey, look, oil, it works too. But, I mean, what do you even do? Yeah. Like, the energy, the, the energy return on energy investment of, like, <laughs> all other energy currencies is just so much lower. Like, what do you even do? <laughs> we'll we'll put a link to uh, an unknown sourced article on energy return and energy invested <laughs> in the in the notes for this episode. I don't know I don't know where we'll find that, but we'll. I do wish something. someone yeah, also I, made, I also, also wish someone made a show on alternative energy that <laughs> yeah, some sort totally. of discussion about it. That'd be pretty good. <laughs> Why has nobody talked about this before? In in terms of the the last two hundred years. And humans, in a sense, coming online to realize that we can be doing more than just starting fires and staying warm. Um, there's the thought, there's the idea that carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for a really, really long time. It's it's on the order of thousands of years. So when we put carbon dioxide in to the atmosphere like we are doing right now and we have been doing for the last 200 years that the, the effects of that are going to be with us for a lot longer than any of us are going to be alive and 
it's it's really hard to convince people that that is bad. I mean, from from an objective standpoint, if you're standing on the moon watching this, you would say that's bad because you're not on on the planet. But so much of our culture and society, especially Western countries, which are the ones I mean, it, we talk. I'm saying Western in quotes because China is quickly becoming a Western country. Um, is it? I don't see it moving across the Pacific, right? Continental drift. That's why there are, <laughs> that's why there are quotes around Western. Um, industrialized, perhaps? Yeah, industrialized countries. So, in those cultures and in that sort of society, you can either have this bright green earth with deer hopping around and pretty flowers growing, or you can have this giant pile of money and woo! <laughs> unfortunately, fields of daisies don't make the world go round right now. And so basically everybody, even though we have this massive surplus of time to, to dedicate to things like research and leisure and uh, tech chats and side chats, uh, we're still stuck on the, the, the idea that we have to get as much as we can personally on a personal level, even though there's this massive abundance of food and of energy. And I think that if we can sort of adapt in a, on a broader sense, if we can adapt our thinking to realize that we have this surplus, we might not need to depend as strongly on money, first of all, and try the idea of trying to make a living and needing to work very, very hard for your entire, most of your lifetime, your entire adult lifetime to just exist in society. I think we can in, enact broader change if there's less of a focus on that and more of a focus on what's good for the earth. Like the least effect we can have on the earth, the better, but that doesn't make money for anybody. Mm -hmm. I think on on that note, you know, I'm just thinking, it's like, well, what would motivate people? And we've already just established that money motivates people. So I think if you're looking at ways to reduce the human effect on climate change while also having some sort of collective effort, you almost need to enforce some sort of taxation, either a taxation or an incentive program, one way or the other. I guess either works because one's saving, one's charging money. Um, you know, like, I'll, like, you know, get, I'll save 50 cents by getting, like, a medium drink instead of a large, right? Like, that's, and it's, it's not like I can't afford the 50 cents. It's like, well, it's cheaper, right? Like, so I, th I think when you start saying, you know, you'll re either reward people for saving energy or taxing people for overusing um, or both, then I think that's probably the only real way to see some sort of change in human behavior, I think. Every economist I've ever heard speak on the topic has basically said the carbon tax is the only way to do it because that's the only way to really provide a disincentive to using carbon. Yeah. And I think I talked about this in the alternative energy or, uh, thing chat that we did. Like a really good one was has been proposed and talked about on NPR's Planet Money, which is great. It's basically a carbon tax, but like all the revenue collected is then gathered together and dispersed on an average basis uh, come income tax time as a refund. Okay. So like it should be more or less zero sum, mm -hmm. but the fact that you've taxed the carbon, like people still see the higher price on carbon intensive things, mm -hmm. they're less likely to do it more inclined to save money and make more money come tax time. Mm -hmm. But didn't didn't Australia just recently get rid of their carbon tax once they got the new... They had a change in government, uh, either this year or last year or whatever, and the previous, uh, previous head had in, enforced a carbon tax and they didn't see any change and so they got rid of it. I'm not... Well, I don't know. I haven't heard very kind words spoken about Australia's new prime minister. <laughs> I forget. What did he... Didn't he have, like, a gaffe in Canada? Like, he mispronounced someone's name or something like that? He's, like, Canadian... 
He's like, oh, oh yeah, Canadia. Canadianas or something. Oh, Canadia. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Here, I thought he was going to mispronounce Wayne Gretzky or something. No, I guess as of July 1st of this year, they've abolished the carbon tax. I don't know. In stark contrast, like British Columbia's carbon tax appears to... It's not zero-sum as far as I know, but it has apparently curtailed carbon-intensive processes with no discernible effect on economic output. Really? that That's kind of surprising to me because... So much. I. I mean. I guess you don't. If you're logging, you don't have to be burning that wood. You can just be building houses with it. Let other people burn it. <laughs> well, I mean, if you're burning wood, that's a carbon neutral process. Like yeah. that's okay. If you, as it's long like, as you're planting trees, which they are. You know, digging out. You know, millions of years old trees that have since converted and burning those. That's the problem. Right. <laughs> who's doing? Who's doing that? I don't know who's a. That sounds pretty bad. It, yeah, nobody does that here. It's crazy. <laughs> there's been there's been a lot of talk about ways to reduce carbon pollution, and and one of the, the the really interesting things that I've heard is how good for you, how good for the earth eating things like insects are compared to livestock. Yeah. Basically. Pound for pound, you can get so much more insect with, like, say, a gallon of water than you could from a gallon of be- uh, for beef. And, again, this is sort of a societal thing. There are a lot of cultures where eating bugs is normal, and, and I've talked before about how you're eating bugs all the time, even if you don't know about it. <laughs> um, and... So there, there are tons of things like that that we could be doing that would, even even in terms of having people bike or take buses or anything like that, rather than driving whatever long commute, most people, the average commute, I don't know, I don't mm-hmm. know what it is, but it's it's probably somewhere between twenty and forty minutes. I think it's yeah. around. Tw- I think the average is around twenty minutes. Yeah. Based um, on the last figures I read. Yeah. But see, ah. you'd have to incentivize that, though. If if you could enforce, like, a government subsidy on purchasing a bike or just, you know, a $50 per year credit on your taxes for riding a bike, you'd see, like, so many more people do that. I or, think. like, do what Calgary does and have beautiful, like, actual functional bike lanes everywhere. Yeah. People oh, are like... Anyway, London, Ontario, take note. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. Kids, but this place is a shithole for bike lanes. <laughs> it, oh. it becomes a problem when you have the, everyone driving cars that are meant for four or five people with giant trunks, and they're driving them one person on the highway for 20 minutes on average. 40 work. for Calgary. <laughs> 40 in Calgary? Yeah, it, it's literally 40. Um. I, I'm sure it's, clo- it's I'm sure it's more than 20 in Ottawa because so many people, so many government workers commute from an hour away. Yeah. I'm or sure like I'm Toronto. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> Toronto. <laughs> Toronto is is actually like one of the worst places in North America, or I think the world to commute. Yeah. Apparently. Probably, I would think there are cities in Japan that. Yeah. Would probably have. India too. Yeah. The Japanese aren't nearly as car centric though. Yeah, that's true. It is true, and same with India. India is not necessarily as car centric, and if they do have vehicles that are powered by gas, they're they're smaller and not necessarily these giant, yeah, two thousand pound. Yeah. Cars. Or motorcycles or scooters they use, I think. Yeah. At least. That's so I think what you're te- what you're saying is I should buy like one of those nice fancy two seater sports cars and drive that to work. Exactly. Yeah, because it only no, has two yeah. seats. No opportunity to fit four people in it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm not wasting the space. Yeah. And see, and then you get a V8, so you just, you know you get to work faster. So there. <laughs> it's true. It's really true. <laughs> Can we do something I don't know that we've ever really done on this show? And Rob, I'm going to stop you right there. I'm not taking my clothes off unless you start paying me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole different kind of carbon tax. What? <laughs> we are carbonaceous beings. Um, I want to go back and t- and f- just go back to 
um, a couple of episodes that we've done, electric energy or elect, alternative energy and electric cars, and talk about the fact that they've now said that Tesla will basically have an infinite mile warranty on it, the new Teslas that are coming out. I really hope, among all of the millions of other reasons that have been given and that we gave in that episode, that people will see that these electric cars, and especially the Tesla, are just fantastic. Uh, th these new models, what was it, the Model S, that are coming out in, I think it's starting in 2017, that are coming out in, in large numbers, are going to be, I think they said it was a $30,000 car, and they're going to really. Be, I think that's what they were aiming for. There is sub thirty thousand. That's and, competitive. Yeah, they would have, I, several hundred. Like it would work on the range, so it'd be between three and four hundred kilometer mile range. Which for, I think that's probably ninety percent of people would be fine. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, if there would be even more of an incentive if you knew that it would be covered by warranty because these cars are so much less likely to break down. They can actually inf have this infinite mile warranty on... That's on the drivetrain only, though, right. yes. Yeah, yeah. But there's no engine? Yeah, there's no yeah. engine in electric cars, so they're a lot less likely to break down. The... That's going to be the most important exactly. part of the car. <laughs> well, it's a motor. It's not an engine. Yeah, yeah it's a motor. Right. And... Electric motors are incredible, and they can run forever without any problems. There's, like, one moving part. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And well, most of the parts don't even touch each other. They just... Yeah, it just flows. Bearings. It's and it spins. It's... Yeah. <laughs> the, the bearings are the only things that would ever get worn down in the brakes, I guess. <clears throat> um... So let's go back to some of the ways that you can fight climate change because I want to talk, especially with Nick, because I know we've talked about this a long time ago, but I don't know if you've been keeping up, but carbon sequestration. Um, yeah, I, the ways I keep that, reading about it because, I mean, yeah. I did research on it. No, 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 I don't, I don't mean that you did research. But um, carbon sequestration is the idea that you can take carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere or that you would otherwise be releasing into the atmosphere as a, as a result of industrial processes or a car or whatever, and you would basically insert it into some material, either chemically or mechanically, that would stop it from being released into the atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, and so you, you might recognize this. I certainly did recognize it as something that's been happening with our oceans and with... Um, especially on the sea floor for as long as there's been life, and as long as there's been carbon dioxide, because the carbon dioxide, or the, I guess it's the hydrocarbon cycle in water, the, the carbonate and water and CO2 cycle, lends itself so well to storing carbon in a solid form underneath the oceans. There's so much... Calcium carbonate, for instance, is the main one mm -hmm. under there. Or if like we, even carbon dioxide clathrates yeah. on the ocean floor. Yeah. Well, and I don't yeah, know if you remember, but Doc, uh, Tom Wu did work yeah. on that. There, there are also there are things like uh, what are they zeolites that will do the same thing. Uh, um, my work was on moths, but yeah. Uh, yeah. zeolites and moths will both... I think there are some zeolites that'll do it. Yeah, moth is molecular organic framework, if I'm not mistaken. Metal organic framework. Metal organic framework. Um, yeah, I mean, they're all, it's all the same idea, basically trapping carbon. I mean, those in those cases, it's, it's normally mechanical with maybe a bit of chemical interaction. Yeah. Um, yeah. And basically, that's one of the best ways we have of keeping the carbon dioxide levels in our atmosphere low, and it's why they're so low right now, is because so much of it is tied up in the oceans. But A, to do that on industrial in, in industrial processes is very expensive, and B, with global warming being getting worse, 
the carbon cycle in the oceans is actually shifting to where things that are made of calcium carbonate like coral are with the warming oceans finding it harder and harder to stay in solid form and they're revert they're they're being basically destroyed well um, and i mean like ocean acidification like more acidic conditions yeah. will eat away at calcium carbonate right and that they're becoming Chemistry. more yeah it's it's a feedback loop where any of all of these things are happening and they're all making the other worse yeah was well, this the equilibria shifts to the other side yeah kind of thing yeah yeah and so as more carbon dioxide is getting pumped into the air more of it is entering into the oceans which is making it more acidic and is making the existing carbon dioxide that's there uh, obviously there's a balance because the more carbon dioxide there is the further it's going to shift things to storing co2 but as it gets more acidic it's it's chemically pretty complicated but long story short it's bad news for is it chemically pretty complicated it's it, carbonic acid equilibrium rob yeah come on, on rob jeez <laughs> <laughs> the equilibrium is complicated because as you add CO2, it's making the oceans warmer, it's making them more acidic. But if, if you're adding CO2, it's also pushing the equilibrium further onto the calcium carbonate side. So I'm saying there are balancing there are things that balance it out. It's not necessarily all pushing towards um, the loss of calcium carbonate in the oceans or whatever carbonaceous right. um Because you have the temperature element. Yeah, but the, yeah. the balance is shifting in in that in the bad direction where we're sure. going to start to see coral. Uh, we've already started to see coral disappear in coral reefs. And yeah, it's just it's just bad news all around. But if we can do things like what Tom Wu's research is is looking at, does, does he work? I'm sure he works with people that are doing the actual experiments. But what he did was the computer simulations of of how. Uh, the work that we specifically just talked about was uh, like one of the ideas for CCS, carbon capture and sequestration or storage, um, is you can just pump that down to the floor of the ocean. And because there's so much pressure down there, it, it's just like the water molecules actually form a cage around carbon dioxide molecules. And you basically just stuck it there and it's not going to come back for geological time scales. The problem is you have to be very, very careful about where you're putting it because as his work showed, if you put carbon dioxide down and there's already a methane clathrate because there are methane clathrates down there, um, just because natural gas will leak out of the ocean floor, but if it's leaking out very deep, like carbon dioxide, it'll get trapped because of the pressure. Um, but if you pump carbon dioxide down there, you can get exchange of carbon dioxide for methane. Hmm. And so you'll end up starting to leak out methane. And methane is 21 times worse yeah. than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. Right. I think it's 21. But, yeah. So you have to be careful about where you're putting it was the long and short of his research, that right. particular part of his research. So one of the interesting arguments that I've heard in terms of solving a lot of humanity's more pressing uh, chemical problems, like this this in, in essence is a chemical problem with carbon dioxide and with methane, with all these things, is what would happen if you disposed of these chemicals by shoving them into subduction zones in the ocean? And I haven't heard sure you mean. against it. So basically, placing uh, there there are lots of places in on the Earth where you have seafloor that's being shoved underneath continents, and it's mm -hmm. a couple kilometers down. But what what would happen if you took these sequestered materials, or even things like nuclear waste? What would happen if you took them and contained them and then put them in the subduction zones? They would basically be crushed and melted into the crust of the earth again, which is where they started. Well, in like a million years. No, well, it doesn't have to be that, like it wouldn't be quick. I'm, I'm not trying to argue that, but if you, if you, for instance, and this is starting to get into the next level of a, of a civilization is actually taking control of the planet and 
I mean, ideally, you would take you would go straight to the the, the subduction barrier, and put whatever this waste product you didn't want right there, either by either drilling a small section in so that it's actually buried and gone. Like, that's arguably a much better, at least to me, that's arguably a much better thing to do than trying to, for instance, bury it just underground on Earth. Because this way it gets, it literally gets fully recycled by our planet's natural um, processes for renewing itself. I, I don't know, do you guys have any, can you think of anything that, well, like an argument against that? <laughs> I just, I, obviously it's not easy to do, but... If you're talking about nuclear waste, like, the only problem with that is you need to be absolutely certain that it's you're not, not going... Out. Yeah, it's not going to get into the ocean, because if that stuff actually starts corroding and, like, getting into the water cycle, you've just... Radiation's bad. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, I think it would be really bad if that started polluting the ocean water. Yeah, but I if think... you could guarantee that it's going directly into the subduction zone and not coming back, that sounds like a great idea. Yeah, I think for all intents and purposes, it's probably easier to just. Well, I know it is easier to just drill like you know nine hundred meters, twelve hundred meters down, and inject it into some you know, formation that will allow additional material and then, you know, cement it in and be done with it, as opposed to trying to rely on subduction to, to bring it down itself, because that will take a long time. Right. And, and I mean, yeah. Like, how would you drill the initial hole? Like, bring, like, a submarine down to the ocean floor to drill the yeah, hole? Yeah, that's the Like, you have to take whatever it is to the subduction zone. Yeah. If you were talking like pumping carbon dioxide down there and like just through a really long tube or something, that might... Yeah. Like if you get the clath rates right at a subduction zone, I would assume they yeah. would be recycled. Then you're drilling a well anyway, and you may as well just drill it into the... Right, the... but that's, that's a lot less... Unless you put it... If I mean, if you had... If they discovered some kind of... Or, uh, I don't know exactly what you'd call it. I'm not a geologist necessarily, but... If you had a seam where there was magma, magma flowing and you could somehow drill down to that and you would be able to basically drop whatever it was, be it nuclear waste, be it um, sequestered carbon, if you could dump it into this seam that would take it, like it would sort of come, like it would, it would be constantly rotating or shifting or whatever, and it would take the material from wherever the, the mouth of this hole that you drilled came out and take it and recycle it back down into yeah. the crust. The magma is coming out though; it's not being pulled in. Like that's how the that's how the ocean, like the islands, are made. Like the right there, there are places where it's coming out for sure because it's under pressure. Yeah. But there are places where it isn't, and there's just there's magma. But you don't see it being pulled in. Like it wouldn't suck it in. No, it wouldn't suck it in. It would be like it. I, I'm thinking of an analogy of. Um, sort of an uh, almost an underwater lake of magma. That, that those don't exist. I, I'm sure they exist somewhere. I'm not. Once magma hits the water, yeah, it, it turns into it, yeah, rock. it turns into oh, rock yeah, not or a, not frozen a water lake, magma, a magma or not not a lake of water. I'm, there's no water involved in this process. Wait, well, you're no, saying you have like sulfur vents, but. No, like, no, no. Where? This is separate. This is on. This is on land. Like, ho like in Hawaii, where you have like the, the lava flows. But further down below. Rob, that's a terrible that's, idea. So you're, you're okay. So you're suggesting throwing things into volcanoes? No. <laughs> no, I'm if you're suggesting. We'll call that the super villain strategy. Waste <laughs> disposal. Also known as the Lord of the Rings theorem. <laughs> So, what what my suggestion? I don't. You guys are laughing, but I didn't say any of that. <laughs> so, what I was trying to suggest was use the subduction zones. You guys were saying it'd be cheaper and easier to do it on land. So I'm saying if no, you could find... I'm saying like you're imagining an underwater lake of magma. That's Some subduction zones are underwater. Like you don't have. No, subduction zones are underwater. This is a separate. 
idea. Okay. On land, you drill down to a place. I'm not saying it would be dissimilar to a volcano, but there are areas where there's magma that aren't being pr- forced upwards, like a, in a volcano. Underground. Yeah. You you might have to okay. go deep, but right. there are places like that. Right. Well, it's, it's below the volcano where the magma is originating from. Yeah. Right. If you can drill to magma, like get all the way through the Earth's crust, right? That's I'm really pretty impressive. sure, like whatever, like there's an upward flux of magma. Yeah, yeah the pressure is just way too high, and then you just end up creating volcano wherever your hole is drilled. Right. And so what I what I was trying to say is that if there was an area where that didn't happen, that's where I would want to put it. But no, I would think that normally the pressure would be pushing up. Yeah. Yeah, so it would get to a point where suction zones. <laughs> I'm now imagining you with like a nuclear waste container going. Ah! <laughs> into a yeah. Volcano. I'm just imagining a drilling rig trying to drill into a magma pocket and having a magma blow. And all of a sudden, like. <laughs> <laughs> that'd be cool. <laughs> fun with that. I wouldn't want to be there, but. <laughs> I like it in theory, if there were robots piloting it or whatever. <laughs> this this talk this got out of hand. <laughs> Let's wrap this up. I if someone can come up with a, a good argument against putting stuff uh, properly sealed stuff, don't don't get me wrong, but stuff in in subduction zones where it would get recycled into the Earth's crust, I think that's well, a pretty subduction good idea. zones are where it's going down, I assume. So I think yeah. that's a great idea. Yeah. But I don't think you find places like that that aren't on the ocean floor. Right, and, but it are... presents technical challenges. But I think it's a great idea if you can guarantee yeah. that it's going to happen safely. Like just off the eastern <laughs> seaboard of North America, there's a subduction zone there. Mm-hmm. Not maybe that's that. where all the cod went. It's not that far out, and it's not that deep in terms of the whole ocean. Yeah. Well, people drill for oil, like, in and around yeah. lots of areas, so... Yeah. But as far as the practicality or the pros versus cons of doing that versus something less... Right. Um, like, our current nuclear disposal solution is basically, let's put it inside this mountain and hope mm-hmm. that never need that mountain ever again over our lifetime and the lifetime of the next 10 generations. Or just put a sign saying, do not move mountain. (laughs) Yeah. Mountain is home to nuclear waste. Please do not disturb. (laughs) I'm picturing at some point in the future um, that the Rocky Mountains getting sort of either... I I, I forget if the Rocky Mountains are... They're still growing, right? Well, there's still pressure... On the yeah. compression zone, yeah. I'm just picturing like the, that vault or wherever they're being stored breaking open, <laughs> eventually, like in a thousand years, and having like the this thing in Springfield where they were burying all the garbage underneath, and everything like nuclear waste just comes spewing out onto the street. <laughs> <laughs> no, Canada wouldn't do that. We would probably use a location on the shield. Yeah. Yeah. Where it wasn't seismically active. Not necessarily. It doesn't need to be seismically active for a mountain range to be growing. Um, sure that's the definition of uh, seismically uh, active. It's, I mean, there, there, there are. Like, wasn't lines. your degree in geology or something like Geophysics, that? Geophysics. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> like the San. Rob, I'm gonna go with Mike on this one. <laughs> <laughs> the San Andreas Fault is not on a mountain range. It's near oh. a mountain range. Right. But. Yeah. If if the Rocky Mountains aren't growing, then it's not. It's not seismically active. Well, sure, it maybe was, not um, seismically, but it's it's still a point of compressive. Yes, compressive yes. force. Yes, yeah. lots of stress, but I, it's sh- I think it's mostly shearing that causes earthquake, like that that we feel yeah. is earthquake. Yeah, it's not necessarily the slow compression of plates together. Well, it's the slipping due to constant compression. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, I, I'll, I'm going to go with Nick on the. Canadian Shield idea. Okay. And you know, <laughs> the majority of you know those concerned in Canada. <laughs> yes. 
It, okay, so I think we've, I think at least for the first go, we've done pretty well. Is there anything else you guys want to talk about before we wrap it up? No. I'm wearing my Stampede shirt today. Yeah, I noticed that. <laughs> I, I like that. Yeah. It's very appropriate. All these, all these hundred year floods that are happening all the time. Every hundred years? Weird. <laughs> 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 what? What I'll leave on is the fact that I learned today that there's a 97% consensus among scientists that global warming is caused by humans and that it's getting worse. But only 40% of those polled in North America, non-scientists, believe that the scientific community is at a consensus about it. Hmm. And that's entirely based on the media, and it's terrible. Hmm. That it is. All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna chuck this at one into the volcano and uh, finish it off. Yeah. I think we need to do an episode on scientific literacy and how it's portrayed we'll in the media. We'll talk a lot about the Texas school board and then... yeah, education system and yeah, yeah. good plan. Sweet. Uh, I don't know what's happening next week on Tech Chat. But uh, you guys have any thoughts? Do you, um, eventually, we'll have to do video games, but I'm not sure that's the topic that's best for next week. Bicycles. Ooh, interesting. Bicycles. Is there is there a lot <laughs> to talk about? about? I I do want to know. Um, you heard about that bike of the future? We could be talking about this off air. Just <laughs> that's the fact. <laughs> or or next week. All right. Anyways. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll we'll chew on that. Um, we'll sit around and masticate. Oh. Go, yes. For now, uh, if you enjoyed this episode, you can go and subscribe. We, uh, we're we actually, uh, the numbers are growing pretty big, pretty fast. Not yeah, pretty nice. big. Um, yeah. Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we'll be getting to the trailer. Nick will be providing comments on maybe if we do an extra teaser trailer, but... Now people already know that it's going to use the Inception music, so that's kind of ruined. <laughs> <laughs> it's never truly ruined. <laughs> it's the Inception music. If you've seen Inception, you'll know what's coming. <laughs> All right. Uh, you guys want to add anything else at the last minute? I think we pretty much covered it. Okay. I would rather not have global warming because... Like in cool weather, it's nice. You can bundle up. You can add extra layers. But in hot weather, you can only take off so many la layers until it's illegal. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be naked in public, and you don't want to see me naked in public. Avoid global warming. <laughs> All right. On that note, we're gonna try something else. I'm gonna. I'm gonna do. You guys are not allowed to talk. I'm gonna do outro <laughs> music. Here it comes. Are you ready? Ready. <laughs> All right, see you guys next week. See you, Rob. <laughs>